Hi everyone, uh, welcome to the third in our live webinar series for BOQ specialists designed to help you get through this pandemic period. Um, really pleased tonight to have a fantastic special guest in We endeavour to get you out of here uh, on time. Uh, there is a little question and answer bubble at the bottom of your screen. Please click on that and add in any questions throughout the presentation you'd like us to answer at the end. Uh, Peter will do his best to answer all of them. Um, if we don't get to everyone, uh, we will follow up and, uh, and provide an answer to, uh, to your question. Uh, Peter is the Chief Economist and Head of Market Strategy at the Bank of Queensland. He's worked at the Federal Treasury in Canberra, as well as in senior economics roles at Bankers Trust and CBA. He's also co-authored reports on the Australian Chinese financial systems, and they gain significant domestic and international attention. Uh, I must admit, I love getting Pete's uh, weekly economics updates. Uh, they're a really good read. It's a really interesting time to read them as well. I won't steal his thunder. Uh, but if you would like to subscribe to his weekly email, uh, just let us know and we'll make sure you get it. Uh, so on that note, Peter, I'll hand over to you. Thanks very much, Tim, um, and uh, very nice pot plant really added to uh, the, the, the feel and the look of the screen. Um, so thanks very much, everyone, for uh, for dialing in. Uh, I'm not going to give um, throw any charts or tables up, which is what you usually get economists. Ideally, I'd like to make this as much a conversation with you guys and you know, talk and provide the answers to you, what your questions you want. But what I will do, though, is speak for about 20 minutes uh, on three things. One is on um, the global backdrop. The second one is domestically, what does it mean for the economy um, or how our economy is going? And the third one is some of the long-term implications of what we've been through uh, in the last, uh, over the last couple of months. Uh, now, importantly, with the questions, don't limit it necessarily to what I speak about. So you can talk about, you can ask questions about what, I, what I've, uh, talk, I'm talking about, but you can, uh, any question is going to be a good question. All right, so as I said, there's three things, the rest of the world, how, what's the current state of play, Australian economy, and um, some long-term implications. All right, so on the rest of the world, uh, increasingly there's been a focus on China. That's been the case now for the best part of 10 years. The reason for that is that uh, the Chinese economy has been actually for those 10 years. How that goes has been the most important driver of the world economy. The US is the most important um, place to watch still for financial markets. But for economic growth, there's changes in China that uh, really matter. So that's why it's number one, it's worth watching. Number two, of course, it's our major trading partner by a long way. So about 40% of the stuff that we, goods and services we sell go to China. But the third reason why it's most important at, right now is that China, of course, was the first into the quarantining uh, social distancing policies, was also the first out. So how China goes, will hopefully provide us with something of a bit of a guideline in terms of how we will go in uh, in coming months. So let's just quickly recap with what happened in China. So late last year, the uh, the, the virus first appeared there. Sometime around late January, uh, the Chinese decided, look, the only way we're going to beat this thing is actually shut down a large part of our economy. And that remained the case for about six weeks up to early March. And then slowly, those restrictions were unwound so by about mid-April, they were largely unwound uh, across the overall economy. What that did mean, though, is that uh, for the first quarter, economic growth in China fell 10%. And that's the first time through the time that Chinese uh, GDP has recorded since the, it's World War II that they've had such a decline. So it's a really, really big number. However, since they've started to open up in March, we have actually started to see a bounce back in, uh, in, in, in their economy. And what's very noticeable is that uh, the manufacturing sector or things that are involved with goods um, are opening up quicker. So factories are opening up a lot quicker than uh, you know, bars, restaurants and, and so forth. One of the things that's really clear is that while China has been able to get back to making cars pretty quickly, consumers still, after what they've been through, understandably, are quite cautious about spending their money. And they're very, very cautious about going to restaurants and essentially, they're so cautious that they've actually, after opening up cinemas, actually shut down cinemas again because it's just not worthwhile them them opening back up. So what's what looks like um, China's happening in China is that Q1, as I said, big fall. It will be, it is picking up in the second quarter, and looks like the third quarter will be stronger. One of the other things that's happened though from China is that yes, consumer spending slower. The other thing that's noticeable is that not everyone who had a job 
before the economy shut down has got a job now. So the unemployment rate is a little bit higher. And also not every business that was around before the shutdown is around now. So there have been some bankruptcies. So what that means is the bounce back, we're not going to be bounced back to where we were. We're certainly not going to bounce back there very quickly. So that's the um, lessons from China, that the, there will be a sharp bounce back as we, as, as, as we unwind, the, unwind the quarantining. The bounce back, however, won't get us back to quickly where we were. And uh, that's, um, the, that's the key lessons. One of the other issues that Chinese economy is currently facing, though, is that as it's starting to get stronger, the rest of the world's been really weak. And essentially, from late in, late, in mid late March, virtually all the world economy was shut down at some point in time. China then started opening up, but through, as we know, month, uh, month of April, uh, us, Europe, and the US were all, uh, all pretty closed. Now, we're starting to see from now ish, Europe starting to open up and the US starting to, uh, in, uh, economy starting to rise. But if you look at how Europe and the US has gone, their first quarter wasn't as weak as China because you know they were uh, their economy was opening up longer. But it's their second quarter that will be really weak. So I mentioned China was down ten in the first quarter. That looks like the sort of number that will happen in Europe and the US in this quarter, the June quarter. Now those GDP numbers may or may not mean something to you, but what might is that in the US the unemployment rates in March was four and a half percent. It looks like in the second quarter, it'll be somewhere between 15 to 20% unemployment rate. And some people think it could be as high as 30%. Like these are extraordinary numbers, numbers that the US economy has not seen since the Great Depression. So it is a really, really big, uh, really big impact. And obviously that whole question, that I went, uh, the whole analysis that I went through with China, you know, how strong is the bounce back? How quick is the economic recovery? Uh, is something that the US is thinking about um, a lot. And it's the reason why they're opening up the economy, despite the fact they've still got the best part of 20,000 new cases a day. And that really is one of the risks. So, the, you know, we've basically thinking about opening up as uh, the number of new cases in Australia is 20 plus or minus. In the US, they're opening up with this 20,000 cases. And so that means there's a real risk that as they open up their economy again, the, uh, the virus comes bouncing back. And indeed, there is some signs in some of the states, like Texas, that have opened up already, that the number of new cases start to rise. So that is one of the real risks that if, you know, the US and Europe could follow what China's doing in terms of this pattern, but because the virus is still around, there's a real risk in the coming months that they might have to sort of close down some industries and parts of the economy yet again. The other big risk, of course, uh, in uh, US and Europe is that uh, you know, while it's not clear about whether seasons and temperatures matter for the disease, you know, um, there is that thing that could be. And as they get towards the uh, end of the year with Northern Hemisphere winter, then the virus could re-emerge um, around. So there is real risk that, that's in Europe, in Europe in particular, um, that we might get a so-called second wave. The third big risk uh, globally is the emerging market. So while the developed countries, once they... Um, and China, once they came up to speed in terms of the threat of the virus, they really started to ramp up their testing and got their hospitals prepared, et cetera, et cetera. Of course, in many of the emerging markets, they just haven't got those resources. So they haven't been able to do the testing. Their hospitals are not quite the same. People have to go to work. They can't, they can't stay at home. The governments can't support the economy as, um, as, as they can in, 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 the, in the developed world. So, and many of the emerging markets got a lot of debt. So even if the developed countries manage to get through this, there is a real concern that in emerging markets, um, their growth could be actually quite weak this year because they haven't got, got lesser ability to actually deal with the virus. So what, what's the global backdrop? The global backdrop is most likely through March and early April, that was the weakest part of the economy. China's already picking up. It should continue to do so as consumers gradually become more confident. How strong the recovery is, we're still uncertain. Uh, Euros and Europe look like they're improving, so that's also a good sign. But of course, there's always that issue about will the virus come back uh, and how, how strong will the recovery be? Which brings us on to my second uh, issue I want to go through, and that's how our domestic economy is. Now, of course, <clears throat> we've had extremely good news. Um, you know, one month ago, we were very worried about the rise in uh, new cases, but a lot quicker than most other countries, we've managed to reduce new cases, and that's very good news. And as we all know, there's been big discussions about opening up the economy, and we've already done some of that in terms of the, in terms of some of the social uh, distancing we have, we have with our friends and so forth. What that practically means from an economist standpoint is that when people were doing their forecasts, the implicit assumption was sometime around about June, mid-June, 
the economy would start to open up and then things would really start to unwind as we went through the third quarter. But it looks like we're doing everything about four to six weeks earlier than, than, um, than what, we, what, what we thought we were up to. And that is good in terms of how weak the economy will be and how low, how weak, and how weak, how long it will stay there. So it looks very much like our first quarter also wasn't strong. You know, let's go through it. We had bushfires in January. We had China essentially shut in February, and then as March went on, we uh, basically shut ourselves. So the first quarter looks like a bit weak. We know that the second quarter, because in April we've basically shut about a third of our economy, it must be weaker still. I mentioned that China was ten percent in first quarter. Those are the forecasts for Europe and the US for the second quarter. And they're also the sort of forecasts people at like the RBA are putting out for our second quarter. And to give you an idea what that means practically for the unemployment rates, currently our unemployment rate's five and a quarter percent. People are thinking it could be somewhere like nine to 11 percent in the current quarter. And we'll find out those sorts of numbers sometime in the next couple of weeks. So there will be a lot of people unemployed. In fact, there's seven percent less jobs in typical quarter surveys uh, now compared to uh, mid-March. So there has been a lot of people who have lost their jobs. Now, if everything goes well, uh, it does look like as we go through this quarter, things are gradually opening up. And by September, um, many parts of our economies should be back up and running. Now, as I mentioned earlier on, one of the um, lessons from China is it'll take consumers a fair while to get the confidence back to start spending money. There was a survey done in the last couple of days which sort of showed that, like, only about 20% of the people who want to get into a plane or go to a cinema right now. So it will take a while for consumers' confidence to get back up. In fact, by and large, the rule of thumb will be less popular states and industries where less people have to work together, they'll be the ones that open up first. But the more popular states and the industries where more people come together um, will open up second. So practically that means if you want to get your nails done in the Northern Territory, you'll be able to do that pretty shortly. If you want to go to a grand final in Sydney or Melbourne, you're going to have to wait a fair while. What does this mean uh, in terms of um, industries? Well, one of the bits of good news is that we are worried about droughts and bushfires in January, but we've had a whole lot of rain in, in coming months. And it looks like the agriculture sector, the farmers, will have a fantastic uh, year. So that's really good news. The miners, particularly iron ore miners, will also do very well because in particular, the Chinese want to really increase the infrastructure spending, production of steel, and they'll demand a lot of iron ore. Uh, manufacturing, that could be one of the pluses. Manufacturing has really picked up because we've had to manufacture more of our own masks, uh, protective, more generally other protective equipment, uh, ventilators. So it looks like manufacturing will be a bigger part of our economy, and that's going to be one of the things that come from uh, come, come from this. The construction sector will be mixed. So yes, there'll be a whole lot of infrastructure spending here, and the governments are really will will need to start ramping that up. Less the case though on housing, and that's something I'll go through uh, in, in, in a minute. On the retail and wholesale industries, retail spending was unbelievably strong in March, the month of March. That's because everyone wanted to put toilet paper on the shelves. As we go through in the coming months, retail spending will still be decent because you probably still want to cook at home and not go to a restaurant, but not sort of the uh, spending levels we've seen. One of the interesting ones will be tourism because we know international tourists will take a while to come back here. So intrastate movements, particularly in places like South Australia, WA, will start to pick up sometime in the next month. Interstate movements will take a little bit longer as different states get comfortable with how uh, new cases are elsewhere. But international movements, particularly outside of New Zealand, will take a lot longer. And indeed, Standard & Poor's, a rating agency, said that may not uh, fully come back to 2022-23. So that's about three years' time. Uh, so that's a fair while. Now, for our tourism industry, what could happen is that instead of overseas people coming here, we stay here and, uh, and look around Australia a lot more. And indeed, we actually spend more overseas than we do domestically. So that has the potential to fill a fair bit of the hole left by international, uh, international tourists. But of course, if we're worried about the economy, we're not going to go on holiday. And of course, domestic tourists actually spend less than international tourists, as typically happens when you uh, travel overseas. So it may not be quite the same replacement, but as the economy uh, opens up, at least there will be uh, some growth in tourism. There are two other issues I wanted to speak about, about our economy opening up. I mentioned um, residential construction. One of the issues, if we're not going to let people in here, is there's just less migration, less people going to our universities, less uh, immigrants coming here overall. Population growth has been very important for the Australian economy over the last three years, very important part of growth, and two-thirds of population is immigration. 
So if that is essentially zero for the next 12 to 18 months, that's going to really take out some parts of the economy. And obviously builders are going to be one of the people that uh, really feel that. One of the other things that's happening, of course, is that businesses are just not going to invest. And if you don't invest today, that hurts growth tomorrow. And all this means that one of the important things we'll need to see is more government spending. Because if consumers can't spend because they're running down their incomes and businesses can't spend because they're running down their incomes, the only people that are left with is, uh, is, is the government. And the good news is the government is doing that. Government spending in the economy uh, by Australia is actually amongst the highest in the world um, in terms of supporting things with, with, the, with the COVID virus. Right now, the focus on the government has been income support. So that's been very good. That's been needed. But now we start to have to move from income support to economic growth support. And the good news is that all state governments and federal governments uh, will do that. The other thing governments are talking about is making changes to make sure we're more a productive society. And you might have seen discussions about things like taxation and industrial relations. If I was going to say two things that the governments really need to focus on is productive is look at education and the health industries because they're two sectors that really need, are going to be more important for Australia going forward. In fact, the health sector will be the most biggest uh, part of our economy in 10 years' time, I think. So health and education is something that the government really does need to focus on in uh, in, in, in coming years, and I think, they, I think they should be doing that. The third and final thing I just want to run through is some of the long-term ramifications of, uh, of what we've been through. And there's four things I want to quickly touch on. One is what we're, a lot of us are currently doing, and that is working uh, a lot, lot more at home. Now, uh, there was... Now, of course, working from home is not a new thing. People have been doing it for a while. Um, in fact, surveys suggested just before this happened about a, a third of people were regularly working from home. The difference this time is the number of people and how frequently you're doing it. Now, as that happened, people got worried about, oh, will our broadband be able to take on all the extra communication like we're doing tonight? And by and large, it's actually held up pretty well. But if we're going to make this a more regular part of our working life, then I do think our communication systems do need to improve. While a very high proportion of Australians do have access to internet by global standards, the amount we pay and the speed of internet is well below average by global standards. And that's something that I think that um, might, might, might be worth addressing. More generally though, I think that um, you know, working from home has meant we've become more efficient. So uh, I've set up my office um, a lot better than what it was. You know, I've got screens and my computers are working. I've got printers, all those sorts of things. Uh, people's practices about how they deal with management and so forth has improved a lot uh, since we've gone through this. So more generally, our efficiency of working from home has improved significantly. But I think that work in the office will always still be a big part of the uh, big part of the game. And one of the main reasons for that is that at the end of the day, people just still want to be with people. And I'll, I'll use an analogy of cinemas. You know, our home entertainment systems have got a lot better over the years. Our big flat screen TV, surround sound systems, really comfy couches, all these sorts of things. And that has meant we go to the films a lot less than we used to 25 years ago. But the proportion of people that go to a film essentially hasn't changed over the last 25 years. It's still the case. Over 25 years, about 75% of the people still go to the cinema at least once a year. Now, one of it is you want to see the latest film, but another one is you just want to get out. You just want to be with people. And for many workers, one of the main reasons they work somewhere is the people they work with. And you just don't get that same impact when you are uh, sitting in your own home. So I think that what working from home has done is allowed us to be more flexible. It's allowed us to be more efficient in being flexible. But I think working from home, working in the office will still be, always be important. The second thing that's happen, going to happen in this is that there's going to be some rise in what I'll term precaution behaviour. And one most obvious one is people are sa saving more. One of the surveys indicated that, um, particularly in the eastern suburbs and uh, the north shore of Sydney, two of the wealthiest parts of Sydney, people are, have really increased their saving as they're worried about the, uh, the economic outlook. And of course, if people are saving more, they're not spending, which is a key issue for uh, what, what, why, why governments need to do the spending. One of the other things about precaution, though, seen from this is some people's supply chains. So, you know, builders, or people in the health industry all of a sudden found out that they needed a part or a, uh, a bit of equipment that was actually made overseas, generally in China. And this whole situation has caught them short. Now, I think one of the things that will happen is that 
uh, businesses will decide instead of actually going to the cheapest possible producer all the time, they'll actually make sure that they diversify their sources of suppliers. Even though it costs a little bit more, they make sure they've got it. And by the way, that's not only, only an issue with overseas purchases. The bushfires also caught some people short, and they've also had to diversify their supply shortages. And this is not only a supply chain question, it's also a question for customers. Think about our universities who have become increasingly reliant on Chinese students and what that has meant for them right, right now. So diversification of supply chains and diversification of consumers, I think, will be one of the important outcomes from what we've just done. I've spent a lot of this time talking about government spending, and that'll be the, the third big trend. Usually in terms of really big events for the economy, so that's World War I, World War II, the GFC, one of the things that happens is that spending increases up to the world, say World War II, and then afterwards it comes back, but it doesn't go back to the level it was beforehand. Because essentially people demand some of that extra uh, spending that's actually happened. And if you think around right now, you know, spending will fall. So all the wage subsidies that the government's given, amount of that will fall. But one of the things that's likely to rise is that the amount of unemployment benefits uh, people get will be a little bit higher in the future. Because people will start to say, well, you paid a higher amount then, why are we changing it to a lower amount going in the future? So I think that's one of the outcomes. The second one is just more generally, people actually will expect more from governments. In 2013, we know we um, had a bit of a debate in the, with about the budget, about cutting spending. Uh, that went to the people. And by and large, people sort of said, we don't want lower spending. If anything, we need, we need higher spending. The biggest increase in terms of spending by governments actually happened in the 1960s and 70s. It was a period when people just said, we need more from governments. And I think there are signs that's actually like to happen. So the third big trend will be that governments will be a bigger part of our society. Which brings me to my final point. If governments are going to spend more, how do we fund it? So you can't fund it, but obviously by cutting spending. One of the things you can do is fund it through higher taxes. Now, one of the issues there is that we already in Australia get a very high proportion of our taxes from incomes. Our marginal tax rate in Australia, our top marginal rate, is not unusually high by global standards. But what is unusual is the level of income it cuts in at is actually pretty low. So we already tax people on our incomes, uh, household incomes quite, quite highly. And in fact, last year, the proportion of people's incomes going to the government, from, uh, taxed by government, was actually at its highest year, highest about 20 years. Our corporate tax rate is amongst the highest in the OECD already. So it'd be harder for that to go up even higher. So it's hard for us to increase our income taxes a lot more. Now, that means we could increase spend, uh, taxes on spending, increase the GST. And that's something many economists speak about. And while that might be economically efficient, there is a whole question about equity. And politically, I think that would be very hard to do. And you need the states to agree to that. And the government of Victoria already says that they are opposed. The third thing, of course, you could tax <coughs> is people's wealth. And there has been a big increase in wealth over the last 30 years, principally driven by the big reduction in interest rates. So house prices have gone up a lot and superannuation balance has gone up a lot. One of the big drivers has been lower interest rates. But of course, we've just had an election about increasing taxes on wealth. That's what Labor took to the election, uh, different sort of taxes on housing, different sort of taxes on superannuation. And of course, we know how that election went. So while it might make some economic sense to increase taxes on wealth, and while there might be ability to increase taxes on wealth, uh, politically, it might be very difficult. So if you can't cut your spending and increasing taxes might be hard, how do you actually pay off the debt? Now, what the government would really like to happen is to increase economic growth. Because if you increase economic growth, you increase incomes. If you increase incomes, it makes it easy to pay off debt. And that's why they're, they're talking about doing all these wonderful productivity things to try and boost economic growth. Hopefully that actually happens. But there must be a real doubt they'll be able to get the economy to grow strong enough for long enough to pay the size the debt we'll have. The amount of debt we'll have in this economy will be at its highest level. This is government debt since the Second World War. So there's a fair bit to be done. Who is going to buy all this debt? Well, one bit of good news is that even, our, even though our interest rates are extraordinarily low by our historical standards, they actually still look quite reasonable by global standards. If you're in Europe or Japan, quite often you're facing with negative rates. So the rates on offer in Australia look okay. So overseas buyers will, will buy a government debt. Banks by regulation have to buy some. And also our Reserve Bank will also buy some. And they've already done a little bit of that. But really the big picture right now is if the <clears throat> Australian government 
can borrow for 30 years under 1%, really the level of debt is not a big issue. We've got a very low debt, we've got very low interest rates. Our biggest issue right now is not debt or interest rates. Our biggest issue right now is to make sure our get our economy back up and running. And that's what the government right is focusing on. So there it is, the three big things. One is that the global backdrop is starting to improve. China is leading the way. Uh, Europe and the US are uh, coming up from behind, but there are those lessons to learn. The lesson is possible second waves, and the lesson is the bounce back of economic growth won't be instantaneous. Domestically, we we have improved a lot better in terms of the UK case than what we thought we would. Uh, some industries and states will open up more than other ones. The current quarter is the worst quarter. Hopefully, if we get no new cases as we come through, we will also improve our growth, but it'll take us a while to get back to where we need to in line with what the sort of um, uh, analysis I provided on the, on the global backdrop. And finally, there are big tr uh, trend changes that's happening. Some of those have been happening for a while, like working from home, what's just happening has accelerated that, but some of those are new, and that's the debt and government spending. Lots of big changes right now from what we've just happened. I'm gonna leave it there. Um, thanks very much again for uh, dialing in, and I might uh, open it up to some questions. Thank you. Matt, oh, sorry, Tim. Fantastic, Peter. Thank you. Uh, everyone on the line, you'll notice under the video screen, there's a bubble with a, a Q and A there. If you click on that bubble, it'll pop open a window and you'll be able to type in your questions there. So we've got quite a number of questions, uh, but please, if something's on your mind, pop it in uh, and we'll do the best, uh, do our best to get to it before 6.45. Um, if we can't get to your question, we will write to you afterwards with a, um, with a response from Peter. Uh, so Pete, first question, uh, you spoke just about uh, low interest rates ongoing before, uh, you know, for government debt and, and so on. Uh, but Lee's asked, what, what is the outlook for, you know, consumer interest rates over the next six to 12 months? Yes, <clears throat> really good question. Um, so the Reserve Bank has, has made a couple of things really clear. So, so the Reserve Bank's main aim, let me start there, is to ensure that uh, finance in the economy is unbelievably cheap and is really readily available. That's its two main aims. The government can worry about sort of boosting demand. The Reserve Bank is making sure that um, whoever wants money can actually get it at a, at a pretty cheap price. And so what it said is a couple of things. First of all, its cash rate, which sort of sets the, the low, if I can use that term, for interest rates for the economy, is going to be at one quarter percent, so 0.25 percent. That's an amazing number, right? But it's 0.25%. That's the first thing. The second thing is that they said is that that rate will remain there for a fair period. And how long is a fair period? Well, they don't really know. It's until the economy really pick, picks up. But uh, as a guesstimate, two to three years at a minimum. So the cash rate is likely to remain at a quarter percent for at least next two to three years. Now, what that means for mortgage rates and so forth, to be honest, I'm not 100% I'm not sure. But what it does mean is that the sort of rates that you can see out there right now are unlikely to significantly rise any time over the next year or two. Interest rates are going to be low for a fair period. If you get such weak economic growth that we have, you know, if you, unemployment rates in the US heading to 30, 20 to 30%, you get those sort of numbers, you need very low rates and you'll need them for a while. Um, maybe just a follow on to that, um, you know, taking into account there were some spikes in, you know, inflationary measures in the, the past couple of months. Andrew's asked, what could happen now that might cause the RBA to raise interest rates? Well, um, so I, I don't think inflation any time in the near term would be it, uh, partly because, uh, you know, as you mentioned, there was some rise in inflation, you know, meat pork prices and beef prices were a little bit higher. But by and large, you know, <laughs> this quarter around, you know, you, I don't know if you saw the papers today, but Qantas were talking about unbelievably cheap fares coming up. I just got something in my email box from a hotel about an unbelievable rate I could get at hotels. So there's going to be some very, very, very low prices coming out. So inflation is very, very unlikely to be a problem um, in, in very term. Look, I, I would think that um, if the RBA increased rates, it'd be one of the greatest things that happen. And the reason I say that, and I, I know quite a few of you might be borrowers here, might disagree, but the reason I say that is if the RBA has to increase rates, it means the economy is good. And it means it's good, and it's been good a lot quicker than what we, th we hope it would be. And let's face it, at the end of the day, with their interest rates of what, two and a half or three or three and a half, that's low. The main thing we should be worried about is getting the economy back up, getting people in jobs, getting people's incomes up. 
And if that means that we have to have a slightly higher interest rate sometime next year or two, that's a fantastic outcome, really. Uh, these questions come from Byron. Um, Byron, I'd be interested to know what your thoughts are about wage growth uh, generally and also in regards to the healthcare industry. Yes, yes. <clears throat> wage growth has actually been probably our Achilles heel. Uh, maybe not for Tim, um, but for, um, for most other people, <laughs> been, a, uh, been an Achilles heel for, uh, for, a, for our economy for a fair while. Um, wages growth has meant it's been pretty low. It's been around about two to two and a half percent across most industries over the last three or four years. And it's meant that consumer spending in our economy has been pretty low. So even before we went through our current episode, um, what, low wages growth has been a significant issue. And if we're going to have nine to 11 percent unemployment rates, it's very hard to see why it's going to go up any time in the next six to 12 months. In fact, if anything, from two to two and a half percent, if anything, it's likely to go lower. And you've probably all seen newspaper articles about potential wage cuts and all these sorts of stuff. So I think in the near term, in the next six to 12 months, if you get any wage rise, that's going to be a pretty good outcome. Uh, over the next one to three years, I think, um, you know, hopefully if the economy really bounces back really sharply, which is sort of you know, a hope, then we might see wages growth bottom about a little bit, a little bit lower than where we currently are, then start to get gradually up. So I think that's as a general statement. Of course, some people are going to be luckier than others. Right. Even right now, um, about 15% of employers say that what their biggest issue is that they just can't get the right staff. So if you uh, work in some areas, I think some areas of health might be one. Uh, another area is some areas of IT would be a second one. A third one is some engineers for help with the infrastructure projects. If you work in some of these areas, demand is going to be so strong, with such a specialised skill set, you still might do quite well through this period. But as a more general uh, statement, Wages growth has been an issue for our economy for the last five years. It'll be an issue for our economy for next year. Hopefully it won't be any longer than that. Cool. Um, Arosh has asked, is the government still going to go ahead with um, income tax cuts that it promised before the last election? Uh, I would be surprised if they don't. Um, this, <clears throat> the government, this government is very much a believer in terms of uh, the private sector sort of driving demand and the government's there to help. Mm -hmm. They would believe that's a really important part. We are politically. I think that um, Labor would probably agree. Uh, probably the one, you know, the the, the one that's sort of going to be more up for discussion, if you like, is the cuts to the top marginal tax rate. That's probably the the really big one about whether um, you know there will be political disagreement about and about pay, paying back the debt. So I think there will be more tax cuts to come. I think uh, in terms of income tax for more general. Whether the top marginal rate is going to be it, I'm not so sure. Uh, and the main reason for that is the issues I was speaking about paying debt. Like, how do we pay it back? Uh, and at the end of the day, top marginal tax rate staying where it is might be one of the thing, uh, policies that might have to stay. Sure. Um, great question here from Feroza. Uh, what's the future for dental businesses? I think they're all, all been great questions so far, Tim. Um, but this is a, it, it is a very good question. Um, look, <clears throat> at the end of the day, people are always going to need to get their teeth done, right? Uh, so it, 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 there's, a few, there's a few things. First of all, if you look at um, what drives people to go to the dentist, obviously you've got problems with it too. But it is probably one area of the health sector that is more sensitive to how the economy is going. So if the economy does pick up strongly, that will be particularly beneficial for, the, for, for, for dentists because um, I think that if the economy was weak for a long period of time, that's something people tend to skip on in terms of for, you know, for the daily check. So how the economy goes, I think, um, uh, will, will be very important. One of the other issues for dentists, at least my understanding is, is that there's been um, you know, a big influx from overseas in terms of well-trained dentists. Now, obviously, if we're going to stop everyone coming in, one of the subsets is less likely to come in is dentists. So there's going to be less... Um, dentists coming in from, from offshore, so that's sort of a, some positive in terms of for, for, for dental practices. Uh, the other one, of course, is what's going to happen at universities. Um, uh, do people still want to go to become a dentist at university or will they look elsewhere in terms of getting more in, in, income from elsewhere? So there is a plus, perhaps less immigration, but of course the other side of not having more dentists coming from overseas is that there's less teeth to get checked. As I said to you before, population growth um, it's been a big driver of our economy over the last five years. 
two thirds of that population growth has come come from overseas. So if all of a sudden we've got a lot less people coming from overseas, that's a lot less demand for houses, but there's a lot less demand for people to get their teeth checked. So there's pluses and minuses about the immigration. Uh, I just think that one of the best things that can happen for dentists is just the general point. If the economy is stronger, there's more incomes, and that means people will feel more comfortable to go get a checkup. Mm. And maybe just, I suppose, following on from that, more people going to the dentist, Stephen's asked, um, a second spike is a real risk. What implications might that have on the projected recovery? Um, it's not going to be good. <laughs> it's certainly not going to be good. Look, I, look, I would say that, um, and I've, I've said this elsewhere, and look, I might end up being wrong, but I actually think that the worst part of the economy has passed. Right? So I think that in um, late March, early April, that was the absolute bottom. Because if you think about it, um, you know, even though we, we, we've just dealt with this a lot better than US and Europe, et cetera, um, it still was a bit of a surprise. So we were making sort of rushed decisions. You know, uh, we didn't really have, really have all our test kits. We weren't testing everyone, all sorts of stuff. Since then, we've got a lot more test kits. Test kits. We've tested a lot more people. Where our hospital system is in a far better shape. Um, we've we've stopped a lot of people coming off sea. So we've got a better understanding of where these things were. So if we have to shut down our economy again, and look, I agree, there's a real, real, real risk that as we've already seen from a factory in Melbourne, as we've seen from an aged care facility in Sydney, there is a real risk that um, the cases will come back up. But I think one of the things is that because we're more on top of it now, we're gonna more lo- we'll be more more likely to localize shut things down. We won't shut down the whole yeah. place because we don't will shut down either a particular industry or a particular area or a particular factory, we won't shut the whole place down because we had to shut it down because we didn't know how big the problem was. Now we're starting to have a bit of a better feel about how big the problem is. And um, that's one of the reasons, of course, why international migration um, will, fl- flows of people will have to be um, keep a little on for a fair while because while we do that, it increases the chance of us understanding about where the issues, where the issues are. Okay. Um, next two questions. I might just blend them together a bit just so we can get through all our questions. These are from um, Shuba and Yar. Um, so do you think the bank interest rates will further decrease um, for borrowers? And, and you know, what is the outlook for the commercial property, residential property uh, markets in the next six to uh, six months to 12 months? Uh, well, the only point I make on bank interest rates is that they're extraordinarily low. Um, can they go much lower? The answer is, is maybe. Well, I, I just I think my bigger issue is that they're unbelievably low today. A, they might go lower. I just don't think they're likely to go higher any time in the next two or three years. So that's probably my biggest thing. They're going to be really low, which is where they currently are. They're going to be really low for an extended period of time. Could they go lower? Yes. You know, as I said, the cash rate, which is almost like the bottom of interest rates in Australia, is 025 percent. The RBA has said that they don't want to go much lower than that. So there's almost like a bit of a flaw there. Um, in terms of where interest rates are, but they could go lower. But as I said, the main one is they're really low and not going to change for a while. What does this mean for property prices? Look, I'm no specialist on commercial property. The main point I'll make on that is that um, different areas of commercial property will uh, will perform differently. So if you're in a hotel or you're in a retail shop, you know you might have some problems for six to eighteen months at least. You know, even a reasonably good scenario. You know, think about um, retailers, particularly a small retailer. You know, people got very used to online shopping. People are not going to have big incomes. So you actually go out to a retail store in the next six to 18 months. You know, people are not going to be spending a lot less. We've already spoken about wages growth. So retailers might be uh, might be a bit of an issue. Um, as I said, with tourism, particularly uh, parts of the uh, hotel sector, for the international tourists, that'll be um, a bit of an issue. Even some areas of offices. You know, if we're going to have higher unemployment rates, people need need less office space. And so particularly for the lower rated office buildings, that could be an issue. In saying that, some areas could do better. Um, uh, industrial, which is like warehouses and so forth, you know, people buy online, that stuff's got to be stored somewhere. So they might do a little bit better. So there could be a real mixture about how commercial property goes. In terms of um, house prices, though, um, you know, if you look at it, in the month of April, prices actually didn't fall quite as much as what people thought. So that's a good news. If anything, they're actually up a little bit in most places. In places like WA, which are uh, their economy is opening up a bit quicker, there actually has been some increased interest in the last couple of days. So that's also good news. So there are some better signs than we um, people thought even just a month ago. The popular prediction for house prices is sort of a 5 to 20% fall sometime this year in line with that sort of economic 
backdrop, as I as I spoke about. The, the big picture is this. The drivers, there's essentially three big drivers of house prices. One is interest rates, um, and we know we've already spoken about that, so that's sort of a bit of a positive. The second one is bank lending. How easy is it to get money from a bank? Um, and it's probably easy to say it's, um, it's going to be reasonably easy, but probably not quite as easy as it was five or six years ago. Five or six years ago, it was pretty easy to get money full stop. One of the problems, though, is our household debt ratio in Australia, that's how much debt we've got to our incomes, was amongst the highest in the world. And so that means we had to become uh, more more regulations had to come on in terms of slowing about how much uh, uh, money the banks gave out. So I don't think we'll go back to the really easy times, but uh, bank lending will probably be, you'll still be able to get a loan, particularly if you're a good borrower. So interest rates is a plus. For If you're a good borrower, you'll be able to get money. The third big issue point is demand and supply. Uh, and supply in many places is actually quite low, new supply coming onto the market. Um, that's because uh, the residential construction was slowing anyway, and now, of course, there's been a big uh, decline in people's confidence. But going the other way is that there's also going to be a big fall in demand because, as I mentioned, population growth is going to be a lot lower because there's a lot less people coming here because immigration has been two-thirds of our, of our growth. In fact, not only that, is that a number of people who might have come haven't come, which means there's a lot of vacancies in terms of, for example, accommodation near universities. And more generally, if tourists are not coming here, then short-term um, accommodation, you know, Airbnb and so forth, it's a lot of those places around. So there's a lot of vacancies around. So there's a lot of supply around, not a lot of demand. What does that mean for house prices? And that's the what, why mm-hmm. price. Like, as we go through, the economy picks up, that'll likely see the um, um, you know house prices stabilise, maybe pick up a little bit. But until population growth starts to rise, and that means immigration starts to come back, I saw that it starts to happen. You know, house price growth is likely to be pretty modest. Um, population growth has been very important for house price growth, particularly over the last five years. Mm-hmm. Um, Jennifer asks, uh, what's your view of the international and domestic share market? I mean, the Westfield's been hit hard and it's going to take longer to bounce back. Um, you know, What are your thoughts in regards to when people should be engaging with their financial advisors to buy shares? Uh, so, so usually I start off by having a, uh, a bit of a disclaimer that whatever I'm about to say, just ignore all those sort of things. So I'll, I'll say that now. I'm no sort of a specialist advice in terms of all these sorts of things. The first point I make is that when should you talk to um, a you know, qualified financial advisor? The short answer is you should always be doing that. You should always be speaking to someone to get the best possible advice about your investments and your borrowings and so forth. So there's never it's, it's impossible to time these things, right? So it's always good to get right, right advice, which gets me to my next point. You know, it's very hard to time these things, very hard to time these things. You know, over the last month, I, I did lots of reading and I spoke about the economy and the economy is very doom and gloomy, unemployment rates going up, and everyone's been sort of saying, well, that means the US market can't go up. Well, guess what's happened over the last month? So it's very hard to get your timing right. And particularly for uh, many of you guys, uh, particularly if you're a young doctor or dentist, you know, you, you're you going to be in a job 30, 40, 50 years. So a little bit of movements, even 10 or 20% movements right now, which seem to be really big on a 30 to 40 year time frame, are not quite so big. And if you're at my age, which is sort of, <clears throat> shall we sort of say, closer to 50 than, than 20, uh, if, you're, if you're my age, you know, I'm still going to be around for decades. And I still should be looking at the longer term worrying about little 10 to 20% movements. And that's the same for house prices, by the way. So don't get sort of tied up about timing because virtually no one gets that bit right. Always get good financial advice with what you're already up to. Uh, it's certainly true to say that the uh, US equity market in particular has gone a long way on some uh, pretty bad economic news. It is very vulnerable, but that's why it's an equity market. That's why it goes up and down. Think about the long term. It's very hard to time these things. Hmm. Excellent. Uh, look, this is probably going to be our final question, I, I think, and we've pretty much covered everything. Um, this one's from Jen. So what is your view on the movement of the Australian dollar against the US and Euro? Yeah, that's a good <clears throat> They've all been good questions. That's, an, that, that's another really good one. So um, the way I think about the, and I'll, I'll just use the US as, uh, as a point because everyone knows about that one. Um, our long-term average against the US dollar, and long-term has sort of been essentially for the last 40 years, has been 75 cents. So if you're well below 75 cents, that means the Aussie dollar is pretty cheap, and if you're well above it, then obviously it's more expensive. So we're well below it today. That's the first thing. And so what that means is that 
over long, and there's good reasons why it should be about 75 cents on, on average. So if you're below there over a long term, a long term, I'll sort of say over a one to three year time frame, you, just, you start to expect it to go back up. What sort of things drive the Australian dollar in terms of a more shorter term things? Well, there's a couple of uh, two or three things to look at. One is sort of um, what we export, um, particularly the price of what we export, things like iron ore prices. The higher the iron ore price, typically the higher the Australian dollar. And right now, iron ore prices are pretty high. The second is interest rates. If interest rates in Australia are higher than the US, that's usually a good thing for the Australian dollar. And in fact, um, over the last month, maybe six weeks, Australian interest rates have become higher than the US again. The third thing is so-called a current account surplus. In other words, current account surpluses, we export more than import, which we're currently doing. And if we export more than import, it means we don't need you know, overseas money. You know, we, We're exporting more. So we have a current account surplus, our interest rates are higher, and we've got pretty high iron ore prices. All those things would suggest that the Aussie dollar, which is currently a bit under 65 cents, should be higher than where it currently is. And the answer is, why is it not? And this is the same, by the way, against the euro. And the main reason it's not is that particularly over the last two months, there's been an extraordinarily tight correlation between movements in the Australian dollar and movements in the equity market. The Australian dollar, if the equity market's going up, the Australian dollar typically has, has been going up. And so essentially it's become down to people's sort of view your risk. If you've got, if you get more confident about how the economy is going, then you'd be more confidently buying the Australian dollar. So to get back to the actual actual question, in the, in the very short term, it's people's confidence in the um, stock market or the economy more generally. Uh, in the more medium long term, I'm actually confident the Australian dollar will go up. But in saying that, I actually don't want it up to go up too quick. And the reason I say that is a low Australian dollar is one of the big benefits we've got to help our economy going. And if we end up having an Australian dollar of 65 to 70 cents for the next one to two years, it may not be good for people going overseas if you can go overseas. Um, it may not be very good for you to buy the imported goods, but it does mean it's good for our exporters. And if that's a price we have to pay for the next one to two years for a stronger economy, I think it's not a bad price we're paying. Yeah, fantastic. Pete, thanks for joining us tonight. I'm sure everyone found that very informative. Um, I'd just like to re-offer that if anyone would like to get Pete's weekly um, email uh, on economic update, just let us know and we'll add you to his mailing list. Uh, thanks for joining us. I know it's time out of your evening and time away from your families. We will be having our next live webinar in two weeks' time on Wednesday night, where we'll have some of our other industry partners joining us um, as we head on through to the end of the financial year. Uh, please stay safe out there. Please look after your families. Thanks for joining us and have a great night. Thanks, everyone.